Okay. That's Thank the first. You. That's the first time I've seen you smile so far today. Oh my! <laughs> oh my! Well, I tend to be serious. Okay. <laughs> well, that's one of my issues. In fact, <laughs> one of your issues is you're you're too serious. Yes. Okay. Well, we're going to get into some serious things, but on the other hand. I hope to get into the, uh, I don't want to make light of them, but I would like to, at the end of it, have you look at it as though, okay, with a smile, perhaps, okay? <laughs> we shall see, okay? Yes. I agree, though. When, when I get to the point of being able to laugh at, oh, my gosh, I've been caught in that for so long, it's such a release. And it's not a denial of what happened or the feelings that were involved, but it's just an acknowledgement of a higher level that it didn't need to be that way. Yeah, yeah. And we all go through that, by the way. And then some of the, some of the stuff that happens seems so dramatic and traumatic and all of that, that we're almost conditioned to think, oh, that's very... We've got to continue to be worked up about that that thing, okay? And um, well, all right. Uh, it would be nice to look back at it and say, "Well, okay." <laughs> you know, I, to give you an example, I've dealt with. I can't tell you how many how many um, war veterans oh, with, all, yeah. with all these horrific, traumatic, dramatic war stories they have that keep them awake at night and cause of PTSD and, and they wake up there at night swinging their fists and they sweat and you know, all kinds of stuff. Okay. And after we're done, they can talk about this event or even the events that happened like they were a shopping trip. It's not still, it's not, still not their favorite topic. And they may not be laughing about it, but the heaviness it's like they fell off their bicycle at age five and skinned their knee and it hurt then. Big deal. Then we look back at it now and go, well, <laughs> kids fall off bicycles. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I don't need to make. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, uh, as you said that, and I, I did write down a list of specific events, but uh, one of the more serious ones for me that happened 20 years ago. And, uh, and I know I'm forgiven on a higher level. Well, I'll tell you, I was coming home from work. I, I had done a long shift, you know, 12, 13, 14 hours. And my son, who lived next door, uh, was in the doorway. And I asked him, where's your wife? And he said, she went out to dinner with our best friends. I said, well, that's unusual that you didn't go. And he just kind of looked down. And I was too tired to deal with it. And I was a little annoyed, too, because they'd been having trouble. And he was kind of being a little unreasonable, in my opinion. So I just went to my own house, which was next door. Well, that night, he killed himself. And I have, <laughs> that was, you know, the epitome of me believing my own tiredness and impatience as opposed to what somebody else needed. And I have since, I've done a lot of, work around this and feel like I've contacted his spirit, he absolutely forgives me. And well, he said there was nothing to forgive. That was his path. But it remains as a stark reminder to me what the severity of what I don't wish to fall into. And I repeatedly do. A stark, okay. I think this connects to stuff we haven't discussed yet on this recording, but let me get behind that. 
Use that phrase again, a stark, say it again. Reminder, reminder of what a seemingly simple act of being lost in myself might do to those around me. Okay, I'm making a little note here. Now, I know in a way that doesn't make sense because that incident did not make him kill himself. I, I, I know that. Yet, my, my inability to be sensitive to uh, obviously a fairly deep circumstance I, I just wish to be more sensitive. That's uh, in the correct way. Well, okay. Let me reword that a little bit and see if, this doesn't mean I'm accurate, by the way. We're exploring. We have to explore, explore, explore. For, we're going to end up bringing an unseen therapist on stuff, but we want to really explore and find out what it is, we, um, where we can be most efficient with that. So. Um, I think what you just said was you, is you need to be more sensitive to other people. Are you, you said something like that a minute ago. Yes. Yes. More willing to get through my stuff, you know. All right. All right. And you, you said, oh, see, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in your place. And you had this experience with your son. So you go to your son you ask about the dinner where your wife was and all of this, he looks down and you, you leave that be, you go home. Right. Now I personally have been through that kind of thing. Not just that, but stuff like that dozens of times, dozens of times. And I think most anybody watching this recording would say, well, Oh, you yeah. I've been through that dozens of, not that somebody killed themselves, but that they weren't aware of somebody's true deep issues at the moment. And they chose for themselves, well, let them be with themselves. They need some alone time would be a way to say it and so on. Or something else. I'm going to give you a personal example. It didn't have to do with death and suicide, but it's still a parallel. This was years ago. I was, I was dating this, this lady, and um, she had told me maybe a month or two prior that her father was recently diagnosed with cancer. And so my take on that was, well, okay, people get diagnosed with it, and then they, you know, they go through chemo maybe, or they do some stuff, but it takes a while for them if they're going to die to eventually go through that process, right? So, okay, that's, that's an input I got. Great, fine, fine. Then one day she called me and I, I just had some visitors that come to see me, come, come clear from England. We were gonna have lunch in my home. And she called me on the phone and I said, oh, is there something important right now? I'd like to get back to you because I've just got these visitors and, you know, what's up? And she just, she just said, no, nothing, and just hung up. I thought nothing of it. All right. Turns out her father had died. She was calling me to have a shoulder to cry on or to talk or whatever. And somehow in her perception, I was being insensitive. I didn't even know. I, had, I, had, I was clueless. Okay. But I could say to my, I'd like to have you do, this is sort of a reframing type story, Barbara. Here I am in this circumstance. What should I have done at that moment? Tell me. Well, I think you did what was appropriate to do. We have to let the, another person uh, be honest also and not project onto us what, it, what they okay. need. All right. All right. But let, let me get behind that a little bit. 
there's a difference I'm hearing between that circumstance I just told you in, in my story and what you told me. And that is, I take no blame for that whatsoever. Zero. Uh, it, it's, it's her issue. Now, maybe I'm being insensitive and I should have done something. Uh, maybe. Okay. But I, per, I, I, I just, I just, I, it's her issue. Okay. I've, I'm sorry, you know, and I'm happy to talk later, but, you know, there's a lot of blame came out of her and everything else and all of that. You aren't doing that. You are self-blaming if I hear it right, still, at some level. I don't know if I'm blaming or I'm just sad. That was the last time I saw him. And he was hurting. That was obvious. And I was too tired to be a little more open to it. I guess that self-blame, I don't know. I don't, I don't blame myself for his suicide. I, I don't. And, and maybe if I had tried to pry, it would have made it even worse. I don't know. I really don't know how that would have gone. The thing that bothers me a lot, of course, the beauty of him standing in the door, and I would love to have just given him a hug. I would I've done that in my mind many times over. But the other thing, it just is similar. It's similar in a lot of situations that I'm in that actually I can see, I can feel that there's a need. And I go with my own inertia rather than responding. So is that is does that well, still okay. count on self blame? Well, these are just labels, and we're exploring. We're yeah, ex we're exploring. I don't know, but when you wrote me this this note, and the reason why we're even talking to begin with is you. I'm going to read this to you. I read yeah, it it's true. before. I said, but I'm going to say it again. Yet the dismay and blame toward myself for repeatedly tethering myself to an illusory story too often borders on wanting to give up. Now, you weren't talking about this particular story. There were other, other stories involved. But you're talking about dis dismay and blame toward myself for repeatedly tethering myself to an illusory story. And then you say, I am more comfortable with self-recrimination than self-love. Self-recrimination to me is another word for Blame. I blame myself. I judge myself. These, these are just, these are just words. These are, these just are words. true. Now, this is, and I, I have a much easier time with big circumstances than with daily circumstances. Big circumstances, somehow, something in me rises up and can see the overall picture much easier than in the daily. Uh, actions. And I feel that daily action is what I'm here on earth largely to learn how to uh, be more real in. So <clears throat> it's this, this time after time, just, uh, you know, like these little circumstances, I told you trying to get my brother out of bed or, or not waiting for my husband to sit down at the table to eat. Those kinds of things, oh, that they're little, and everybody would say, puh, puh. but over and over, a hundred of them in a day makes a less than uh, satisfactory life. And there's the sense, and I can feel another way of living, yet the short periods when I tend to live more from that real place inside and I don't let those stories, my own um, impatience or what somebody else is doing, I don't let that bother me. Some, I start to live differently and it almost scares me to live differently. It's like, ooh, you know, the responsibility of that or whatever, um, so then I fall back and I mess up again. 
right. and I'm that's what I mean by I'm more comfortable with self recrimination than I am with self love. Mm-hmm. Okay, most of us are, by the way. We don't really want to admit that, etc. And I, I'll back to I'll go back to some of the <coughs> foundations of our OEFT course and the unseen therapist and all that, and that is that at the core. And quantum mm-hmm. physics has proven this, by the way. We are part of a grand oneness and not running around in separated bodies, even though that that seems quite clear to us that that's what we're doing. We're all running around in separate bodies, but that is that is an illusion. Okay. So there's an unrest that goes on with that, and it manifests in different in different ways. But I want to get back to this a little bit because I think when we were talking about this before we ever started recording, you were you were phrasing it as a sort of impatience. So you get impatient. So you, you, your impatient does things much more methodically than you do. And so, you know, you'll sit down at dinner time and, and eat before he comes, he, he comes to sit down and, and yeah. you're, you have a brother that is, that is uh, handicapped and you get impatient sometimes with him, getting him up in the morning and things like that. Okay. Yes. So it's the impatience, and again, I'm trying to trying to echo this back to you because I'm I'm pretty trying to get down to what the issue really is. This impatience, this not slowing down long enough to this is my words now, yeah. not slowing down enough to connect is bothering you. Did I say it right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right. And even if it, even if that's noticed at the time, something will say, Barbara, just slow down. A tiny, just be willing to look within, be willing to live from that place that is offering itself. It's right here. There's some, you know, no, not right now. No. All right. Let me ask you something. I, I, again, I want to get a good sense of this. All right. I too have impatience. I feel I don't know anybody who doesn't have impatience at least someplace in their life. Okay, get on with it. Get on with it. Most people would much rather watch a most people, many people would much rather watch a basketball game where things are moving all the time than a baseball game, which has a lot of dead time, if you will, between yeah. pitches and that. And, and, and so finally, somebody hits the ball. <laughs> And whatever, okay. We have a built in, everybody, I think, just pretty much everybody has a built in impatience. I have it as well. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Always correct me because I'm just fishing because I don't have all the facts, okay. I don't really have any self blame or get worked up about the fact that I'm impatient. I say, well, I just, imp- I'm impatient. <laughs> but I don't really, it doesn't really bother my world that I am impatient in some areas. Okay. In your world, it does. Now, am I, am I on target here? Yes. And I don't expect to lose impatience. I, I believe that is kind of like a trait of being here on earth, but I do at least hope that I won't go with it so much. It can be there. I, you know, it's an impulse, but to go with it, to manifest it, to blame others for being in my way or taking too much time or that kind of thing. I, I, that enough, enough of that. I think it's a, de- it's a, de- I, I do that too. Okay. But it's a, de- it's maybe it's a degree of thing. It's one thing to, be impatient. I, I would call that normal impatience. Okay, <laughs> whatever whatever normal impatience is. Okay, N- new yeah. new term for the world: normal impatience. <laughs> Nobody knows how to define that, but we'll use that term. You, if I'm hearing it right, are you have excess impatience? You're over the top to the point where it becomes bothersome. You become self recriminating recriminate you self-recriminate yeah. okay yeah all right i wouldn't want to live with somebody like me yeah okay yeah all right 
So, and, and you were, you said to me I, I, earlier, I think before we recorded that, that this kind of thing even gets in the relationship with your husband and so on. Yeah. Okay. So if you weren't my term over the top or excess impatient, your life would go much more smoothly. I, you know, I don't know about more smoothly. No, I, but I would feel that I'm on the right path, that I was learning something. Okay. Another thing I'm hearing, another thing I'm hearing um, from what you said earlier is that you were talking about, yes, I understand, you know, that there's this oneness and I, I can get there myself from time to time and recognize it, but I can't do it all the time. And so I'm hearing, again, correct me, please, please. I'm hearing a comparison in your own mind. Here's where I should be. Yeah. And, and the oneness is, there is no judgment. There is no, I none know. of that. It's just, ah, oh, it's really a, a blissful place. Here's where I should be. And here's where I am. Yeah. It's kind of vain. And she, okay, well, that's another, that's another self word, you know, something's wrong with me. I'm too vain. I'm too, I'm too impatient. I'm whatever. Yeah. 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 I mean, I have looked at that and I said, why do I, why do I think I should be like that? Who, how many people do you know are like that? Why do you think you would be, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, But that, but that side sounds like don't try to be a better person because you know you'll get haughty or something there's something standing in the way of that and maybe i do step into being haughty i don't know i don't know i'm just god dang it you know i'm almost 70 and And so much of my life I've been trying. And it seems like, will I ever get it? Will I ever be willing to get it? Get what? Um, (laughs) Yeah, that's a good question. Get that all this stuff that I keep believing really is not real. Okay. I, I experience it enough to where I know that's the truth. I know that's the real truth, but I keep falling into that darn story. Well, wait, Barbara. <laughs> All of us do that. I do that. Listen, I, I am teaching this grand course that you're a member of about how to get beyond our separated stuff being an illusion into the higher level. I'm not there all the way. No, I'm improving all the time. That's what we do. We are so stuck in this world because it's there 24 seven. And yet there is this higher level that is our true reality that we're unaware of. And it's a process to get there. So we deal with our specific events. We bring in more peace. A little anger here goes, some resentment there goes, a fear here goes, and so on. And so we get more and more peace, and we graduate. I'm hearing you saying, I got to be there now if something's wrong with me. Yeah, maybe I am saying that. And I see the folly of it. I mean, I do recognize self-acceptance is huge. And... And I've been saying for probably about 15 years now, ah, compassion for myself. I'm starting to feel compassion for myself. How wonderful. And seeing the unconsciousness of myself, and that's all it is, is just unconsciousness. It's nothing to blame. But... um, you know, I see that sometimes, but there is still a lot of blame. Well, yes, yes. I wish I had a course that would be a light switch. Gee, read these three bullet points 
you know, and dream about it at night or something, you know, and all of a sudden, boop, you are in complete enlightenment. You're at the very top of our spirit of miracles. Nothing ever bothers you anymore. You're in bliss forever. Nah. Okay. People have been trying that for centuries, if not millenniums. Okay. I it, think, I think is, I do have that story. I think I do, but we, <laughs> consciously, I don't have that wish. I, 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 I don't expect to be in bliss. I, I think there are a few people who kind of are, but they're, you know, like maybe Eckhart Tolle, maybe. Uh, but he had a real awakening that was beyond uh, something, beyond usual. So I don't expect it to be blissful, but I wish to have the balance of my own inner teeter-totter to start to be able to handle my stuff better rather than perpetuating it and even increasing mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I wish to increase my relationship with my true inner self. Yes. And so do I. So do I. And so do I. I can't tell you how many students we have and people who aren't in students. They would like to do that. Uh, they have levels of impatience, if you will, but they have other stuff that they would label differently, but still it's all comes from the same, same place. Now, what we've been doing here, just I'm, to be a technical teacher for the moment, um, has been reframing. We've been looking at the issue, we've been exploring, we've been trying to cut down to the chase, what's really going on, um, and things like that. But a lot of it is reframing. You reframe yourself because you ask yourself the question, well, do I really need to be in this ultimate place? You know, am I too impatient for that? And the, these are all reframing type stuff and stuff you have visited before. Am I on point? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, however, I think so far, while the, this reframing discussion and your previous thoughts along the reframing ways um, are, are useful, but they are, they tend to be, I'm hearing, I'm hearing academic. You yeah. know it, you know it in your head. You don't own it yet. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so what we would like to do is go from, I think, I think, and you have to tell me, okay, we're, we're about to go into a door that I'm seeing, but if it's the wrong door, you've got to tell me, because I'm still, I'm piecing stuff together. I don't know your whole life. All right. But we're about to go into a door where we're going to pick out a specific event in your life. I'm thinking something with your brother, something with your husband, or some impatience type specific event. We're going to bring unseen therapists in to help bring some relief to it. Along, and along with the reframing we've already done, we begin, we begin, we're starting to put stuff on the table. Okay. And the hope is, the hope is we're going to open a door. We're going to get a good start towards allowing this impatience to just be normal impatience, okay? Not get in your way so that your relationship with your brother and your husband and other, the world around you and so on doesn't have all this personal recrimination going on all the time. Now, seem right? Would you add to it? Would you change it? Uh, it seems right. It seems right. Okay. Now, what we want to do is look for a specific event, because that's where Unseen Therapist can do her job best, and we can expand then from there. Okay. And I, 
you've given me two scenarios where specific events can arise. One is with your brother, like when you get him up in the morning, you have impatience kind of thing. The other is some circumstance with your husband. But we want to pick out a specific event that that is in technicolor, okay, that stands out, that, that, that you, you beat yourself up about it when you get into it more than maybe the others. Do you have, yeah. do you have one that we can talk about? Yes. All right, what would that be? Uh, it's fairly recently. And uh, my brother has very weak legs and he has a bad cough right now. So he fell and uh, he cut his head. I cleaned it up. Then I came back in to check on him and he was in bed and I made him get up. He, you know, he justified it. Well, I fell, I'm coughing, I'm, you know, and it was all true, but I had this hardness, this like, I have all these justifications. His legs are weak because he wants to be in bed all the time. He needs to be up. His lungs are bad. He needs to be up so that he sits and breathes better. But it's true, too. He had fallen and hit his head. Even if I needed to get him up, even if that was the right thing to do, my attitude toward him was the problem. It was not the action of getting him up. It was this, God dang it, get up out of that bed. I can hear myself. I can feel it. I can and and see him warily, you know. <laughs> wearily getting up there was something really um not right about that all right now one of the things that is often very important when we deal with a specific event is the idea that the further back in time a specific mm -hmm. event is the more foundational it's likely to be now this is something that just happened. That doesn't mean we can't deal with it. That doesn't mean it wouldn't be useful to work with. But as you were saying that, I kept getting this intuitive hit. Don't know if I'm right. Don't know if I'm right. That this get up out of that bed, that sort of impatience has a deeper foundation. Clear back in childhood somewhere. A, I'm going to guess for the minute, but you fill in my guesses if they're useful, okay. You were perhaps commanded in this way, impatiently, by your mother, father, somewhere back in your, in your, in your past. Teachers, maybe this kind of thing. You were put upon rejected how am i doing well it seems like that would be true but i can't i, I can't remember uh, seems more like you know the like having to get up for school but i had to get myself up so it was like i would be telling myself you've got to get up out of bed don't stay in bed it, it would I, you know, maybe I'm just blocking that I can't remember well, okay. early on. Well, could, could be, but let me just explore it a little bit more. Um, I'm, I'm going to have you say a sentence. I just want to just, we're just poking around. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have you say a sentence. And if you would, please say it out loud. And then tell me on a scale of zero to 10, uh, how true does it feel to you? We don't want the logic of it. We want the emotional response. Okay. okay. So again, I'll give this sentence, said out loud, then give me a zero to 10. And 10 is, oh boy, is that ever true? And zero is uh, nothing. Okay. All right. Here's the sentence. I must do it right. I must do it right. Oh, <laughs> nine. Oh, okay. Well, all right, let me make a little note here. Let's go on, on with that a little bit, okay? 
slightly different. I must do it right or else. I must do it right or else. That's that's less, probably a seven. All right, now the question is why must you do it right? I have an impulse to cry. Right now? Yeah. All right. Well, we're hitting something. Yeah. We're, we're hitting something. Okay. Yeah. Take, it's taken us a while, but we're hitting something. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I do feel it from a long time ago. I feel myself as a little girl uh, looking up to her mother and seeing the kind of like, I feel, well, like so many, you know, when your parent is tired or discouraged, it, it feels like it's your fault. I feel like I, sh I felt like it was my fault. And my mother was often tired and discouraged. She didn't, she didn't really <laughs> like being a house mother with six children, one of them handicapped. It was a hard life for her. Uh, but she was loving all of that. But she was tired and a little withdrawn. Okay. The, to me, the important thing you just said there had to do with your, not what happened, not that your mother was tired and all of this. It's your response to it because your response is, it's my fault. Yeah. Whether that's rational or not is immaterial. Your response is, it's my fault. Somehow or other, she's tired and, and, and whatever's going on, the impatience she may have and so, all this, it is your fault. Now, you're nodding your head, I, I see. Yes. Uh, I, yes. Am I near the bullseye, do you think? or? Uh, yes. I mean, a, a, a parallel memory that is very strong. There were six of us children, all very close in age. And uh, we would go on trips and they wanted us to be quiet. So if we were quiet, if they would say, oh, you were so quiet good. We wouldn't have even known you were there. And if anybody else would, you know, comment on that, that would ride with the car, like, oh my God, your kids are so quiet. My parents would preen, you know, yes, they are. They're so mm -hmm. well behaved. All right. And so making noise or doing something against the grain was like, it was our fault for causing problems. And if you didn't do that and you were quiet, this is my input now, you saw that, you, you, you got that as love. Uh, I don't know about love, but approval anyway. Well, a form, of love. A, form of, a, love. a form of love, approval, yes. Something which didn't happen all that often? Actually, they were very loving. Okay. All right. All right. All right. But I want to get back to the, okay, the, great. That's, that's wonderful. But we want to zero in on this one piece that somehow or other under these circumstances, you are at fault. Shame on you. Okay. Yeah. Now, I want to expand from that some. Or I'm guessing again, but you, you have to tell me. Okay. The, the, the emotional experience of feeling at fault, I am thinking is something like the emotional experience of being rejected. Nobody likes that feeling. And yeah. we, will we will tend to do things in our world to avoid it. We will tend to avoid rejection, for example, if we can, because we don't like the feeling of being rejected. All right. 
And so we will do stuff to avoid it, whatever that is. We don't like the feeling of being at fault. It yeah. says something's wrong with us. We don't want that feeling. Now, I'm wondering, in current time, if you aren't replaying some of this at fault stuff, your brother doesn't get up in the morning, get up, get up. You don't want the feeling of it. He needs to do it the way you want it done, or you're going to feel at fault. He is resisting you in some fashion, not doing it your way. Therefore, you're at fault. Your husband is he's more methodical in some things. He's got to hurry up. Otherwise, you're going to feel somehow at fault. How am I doing? I think that's good. I When you said reject, I realized that's something that has really puzzled me about how quickly I can reject somebody. And I thought, where, where did that pattern come from? And so the way that you said that, I'm, I'm thinking that I felt rejected more than I recognized. And well, I'm, a, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that, go ahead. I'm seeing a connection between at fault and rejection. I mean, they're different things, but I'm seeing that they're like cousins. Yeah. They're like cousins. They're in there someplace. Okay. So I want to, my thought is rather to shift our specific event where we bring an unseen therapist from this one that we were talking about your brother getting up, he had fallen and all of that, and you were impatient with him, et cetera. That's current, but see, it's, the impact of that is larger than it might normally be because it's likely bouncing off of unresolved stuff way, way back, like at fault, rejected, and so on. Yeah. We want to go back to the core of it, the foundation, and go from there. Does that fit? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right. Um, Tell me again, what, what was the, was there, can you find for me a specific event way, 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 way back childhood? Mother, I'm thinking, because you've told me about mother, um, where she's tired, you're feeling rejected at fault, et cetera. Can you give me a specific event there, a technicolor one that stands out for you? I don't know what I did, but I see her with her hands on her hips and, oh, Barbara, that's what I see. And I, I don't even know what I did, uh, but I was young and, and it was not an uncommon comment directed at me. All I was right. a very active child, so it, it, that's not exactly specific, but... It's going to be good enough for our purposes. Okay. See, what we're interested in, and for, the, for those listening into this, I mean, we're getting into some of the advanced part of our course and so on. So I, you know, I can't sit here and teach everything that's going on in the course, but we're going to borrow from it. Uh, there, are, there are methods within our, our course where we can, if we don't remember the specifics of a specific event, we can make it up because what we're really after is not the get the details just right. We're interested in your response to it. Your response is, oh, oh, I'm at fault. Uh oh, something's wrong with me. Uh oh, I'm ge getting rejected. That's your response to this. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. It's the response that we want to get to. We can't change any of the details that went on we can't change how your mother was standing with her hands on her hips we can't change the tone of her voice we can't change the fact that she was tired or whatever we can't change that's like trying to change a baseball score okay you, you, just, you just can't change what we can change is your emotional response to it right not then but now what i'd like to have you do as a test if you would is to close your eyes barbara Go back to that time. Just we don't know the exact circumstances, but there's your, your mother, hands on hips, saying, "Oh, Barbara, okay." And you're having your response. 
what's wrong with me? I'm at fault here, something, that kind of response. Get into it, exaggerate the sights, the sounds, the feelings, and tell me on a scale of zero to 10, what is the current intensity? Seven, and it's very, very heavy. What does heavy mean? You feel heavy in your body? Very sad. Yes. My energy just goes. Okay. These are all clues that we're on something foundational. Okay. Would you agree? I agree. Okay. Um, when you were... When you gave me the seven number, was there a physical, you said heavy, but was there some other physical thing, a constriction in the chest, a, 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 uh, neck, a neck pain or solar something? Solar plexus, way, way down, very kind of like a big heavy ball in the solar plexus. And the okay. sense of the energy just draining out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Those are good clues that we're onto something important. Now, Again, we're, we're here to get a good start. Let's see how far we can go. We're going to open a door. Um, we're going to open a door with unseen therapy. We'll see how far we go with this. Okay. So I, I think we're ready at this point. Well, let me, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to do a little more possible reframing. You know what? May I say something that's really coming up for me? Sure. Protection of my mother. Oh, explain that. Like something in me is saying, don't do anything to criticize her. And I've got to take care of her. She was a lovely woman. And I, you know, geez. So I, something in me feels really Ugh, to even bring up anything that could be construed that she did something that I reacted to. But the way that you're helping to say, don't change those circumstances. And so, somebody else of another nature would have just said, okay, and hopped off. You know, they wouldn't have sat there and, and felt like they were shit, you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. So I see it is me. So I'm not incriminating her like what it feels like i've you know this little girl in me just wants to go and hug her and say it's not your fault it's not your fault and it's not but it's not mine either so okay i well, got it now. <laughs> okay but you, you but you said it's not mine either and that's where we want to go i'm yeah. wondering if we haven't already gotten there unseen therapist yeah. you know doesn't yeah have to she have was a pretty stuff. quick well that feels much lighter yeah, because behind all that, behind all that is, I'm surmising, is there you, there you are, and when you protect your mother, if you can protect your mother, that, that means something to you. What does that mean to you? Does that mean you're okay? Does that mean you are, what does that mean to you, protecting your mother? What does that mean to you about you? I don't know. Well, okay. Let's just call that a reframing question for now. Let it kick around. Okay, with that, with that in mind, with that in mind, let's do an un, let's bring an unseen therapist. Okay. And um, now. One of the things I'm going to do here, and this is part of the advanced part of our course, is, is rather than just do a standard um, personal peace procedure that we teach in the course on this, I'm going to be doing a little more advanced stuff. I'm going to start rambling around, maybe doing some more reframing. I don't even know what I'm going to do yet, because what we're going to do is I'm going to start and then whatever occurs to me, whatever I'm told, we're going to go there. Okay. okay. But it's going, to be, it's going to be easy for you because all you have to do, um, 
It's just follow along, you know. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to narrate the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Now, if, if at any time, it, at any time something comes up that you think is important, say so. Even though we're, we're right in the middle of it, it's not a kind of a, we're closing the doors and you can't say anything. No, your participation, if something comes up, is encouraged. Okay. Okay. So with that in mind, if you would, we're going to relax a little bit. So sit back and close your eyes and take a nice, you know, deep, relaxing breath. And uh, just as a way of inviting unseen therapists, just recall a simple loving moment from your past and just nod your head whenever you're there. All right, good, good. Interesting, Unseen Therapist is always giving us guidance. We aren't always listening, that's the problem. <laughs> so what we're doing now is we're just saying with this recalling a loving woman, we're just saying, ah, okay. We're gonna give you a little something to work on, Unseen Therapist. And we're listening. <laughs> We're going to give you a little, a few kudos here, and we're actually going to pay attention, all right, because they're too involved with their egos often to even hear what's really going on. So let's shift your focus now back to some early age. And while this and things like it may have happened with great frequency, we're going to imagine your mother. At what age? Just guess at what age this might be. Hands on hips type thing. Just give me a guess for it. Six. Okay. So there you are around age six. All right. And you've done something, whatever it is. You're an active child and all of that. And your mother, a source of love for you and for just about everybody. Okay. Has her hands on her hips saying, oh, Barbara. And it's not so much what she says as it is what that means to you. You even become protective about it. Somehow or other, something is your fault. And nobody wants to have the feeling of oh, things are my fault. And until that gets resolved, an unseen therapist knows this, and so do you. Until that gets resolved, we carry that around in current time and behave in ways to avoid the, oh, it's my fault. Irrational things happen. We get impatient, things like that. We're not, ex we're not criticizing these things. It's just what happens. People manifest these things in different ways. These just happen to be your ways. And now we want to go back again. Here's mother, hands on hips. Oh, Barbara. Oh, Barbara. And you're thinking, I'm at fault. But now, we're going to hand this to unseen therapist, but we're going to do it metaphorically. We're going to have you there at age six without the same kind of maturity you have now at your nearly 70 years of age, you know, some more than six decades later. You have a propensity then to blame yourself what's wrong with me because you are interpreting your mother's behavior oh barbara kind of thing in a certain way that needs resolution so in your mind's eye be that six-year-old and see in front of you your mother hands on hips saying, oh, Barbara. And then in your mind's eye and in your imagination, allow your mother to 
transform into a cloud. It's a cloud. It's, I don't know, it's maybe 10 feet wide and 10 feet deep and 10 feet high. And it's just sort of floating in front of you. And it has, it's, it's a dark cloud, something like a rain cloud or a thunder cloud. It's a dark cloud. And it has a label on front, in the front of it. And that label says, it's all your fault. It's not a rational one. No, we know. But the young you picks it up that way. The young you says, oh, something's wrong with me. Oh, I did something wrong. Something's my fault. I'm getting rejected. Uh, 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 you know, this kind of thing. Perfectly understandable. I don't know if, um, but what keeps coming up is I didn't take it as being my fault so much as she is unhappy. Why would that be? Sort of like this real puzzlement, like reality doesn't fit here. I'm playing and she's mad. It did, I didn't, I don't think, I don't feel blame. I feel puzzlement. I feel, right. I feel fear. I feel like, oh, she's upset and she's going to walk away in a huff and I, there's nothing to do. I, um, how did that happen? She's going to abandon me. Is that in there anywhere? Yeah, I guess so. She's going to abandon me. Yeah, that totally withdraws. Just All right. leaves. All right. Good. Good. Any more feedback? No. I mean that that's more yeah, thank you. That that's more like there's kind of like, oh, but mom, you know. All right. Close the eyes, Barbara, and we'll go back here. The my fault thing, as you recall, is something we talked about earlier. Now, it's my perception that Unseen Therapist has done something with the my fault thing, and now it's shifting to a different. I'm afraid she's going to abandon me. And nobody, just like they don't want to be rejected, et cetera. They don't want to be a, abandoned is, you know, even a worse form of rejection, if you will. They are also cousins, but almost equated where one is even worse than the other, abandoned. The feeling of being abandoned and wanting to protect your mother to somehow bring her back in so she no longer abandons you. How does that fit? Yeah. Okay. This feeling of abandonment then. Even if it doesn't matter if she's around, I, I loved to be alone and I still do, but it was that feeling of the emotional withdrawing this, you know, like the caring abandoned from the caring world. Yeah. Losing love is maybe a way to say it. the yeah. perception, the perception yeah. of even though your mother was loving, your response at the moment is, I'm losing love. Am I saying it right? Yeah, yeah. Abandonment, losing love are somewhat similar. Okay. Yeah. Right, and like it. she lost love. I caused her to lose love. That feels very interesting to me. Because when I picture it, it's like this door slams down. She's unreachable. She's not mean, but she's just gone and and there is some blame i caused her to go somewhere you are at fault or responsible yeah that's true i didn't think i felt the blame but i think i i felt i feel responsible for her <sighs> becoming absent. Okay. Any more feedback before we resume? No. Good feedback, great feedback. And I'm hearing in that resolution and more issues coming up. This is wonderful, okay. At least that's the way it appears to me. Okay, now back to the cloud. 
your mother has transformed into this cloud. It's a dark cloud, but the label in front of it now is abandonment, I'm responsible, losing love. That's what that cloud represents. And it's an ominous cloud. It's one that has been hanging over you, if you will, for decades. But we're going to try to resolve this with unseen therapists. Unseen therapist then comes and stands beside you. And she asks your permission. She says, Barbara, I'm really not outside you someplace. People tend to think I'm outside because that's the way they're conditioned to think about God is up there or outside or something like that. But I'm really within you. And I want your permission to blend myself within you and look through your eyes. Would that be okay? Yes. So now she's going to blend inside you. It is you and her. She's your best friend. She's your companion. She's the wise one that has answers you don't have at age six. You may not have at age 70 yet. Okay. We're all getting our answers. All right. But there you are, age six, and she's now with you. There's a comfort there. There's a knowing there. There's a protection there that's useful not only for you, but for your mother. Okay. And so she says, okay, Barbara, from within you. She starts to move your legs as you walk towards the cloud, but with your permission, with your active cooperation, you're moving. And just as you start to enter the cloud, you feel this little cooling, loving, nice little gentle mist on your face. A cloud is nothing but a little fog. All right. And what's in the cloud is in your six-year-old imagination, the darkness and the maybe thunder and all that other stuff that might be going on in there. And you start to walk into the cloud and now you're walking into actually your mother. It is her cloud. It is her impatience. It is her tiredness, her lack of things, her need to be within herself that makes you feel like you may be abandoned, that you're responsible for her, etc. Unseen therapist lets you know, as you are recognizing, this is her issue. And now you're inside this cloud and you see the darkness there. You may not be able to know exactly what the darkness is and the specifics and all of that, but you see dark spots within it. Within it. And as you walk up to them, with unseen therapist's help, you smile at them. You send them, you share with them your love, the little dark spots, and they become whiter. Your mother feels better, and you feel better. Your mother's not abandoning you. She's trying to look out for herself, not really knowing how that affects you. And then you go to another one. Ah, there it is. And it fades, the darkness. And another inside your mother. And another. And another. And another. And then you circulate around with unseen therapists within you. And you look for more dark spots, but these are yours, the perceptions of a six-year-old girl who can't possibly have things correct at this point. But under, we understand, we understand where she's coming from. Oh, important love is leaving somehow. I'm losing my love. I'm feeling abandoned. And we see these little abandonment dark spots. And with unseen therapy. More it's more watching her abandon herself. That really is more like okay. as a child, this, this wonder of, and watching her morph into this, you know, empty woman when she's usually 
it has such capacity for joy and it's, a, it's a, a sadness for watching somebody maybe i'm covering up but well we're going to call it sadness for the moment okay but i suspect there's more there was there more you wanted to say i'm sorry no go ahead i suspect there's going to be something more than sadness because what we're really looking for is not your mother's response. We're looking for your response. And so the, yeah. sad, the <laughs> sadness, the, she's withdrawing in some fashion. Am I still hearing I, little Barbara, am somehow responsible for this? If, yeah. I, had on, if I had only behaved correctly, whatever that was, she wouldn't be doing this. That would be sort of natural for a six-year-old to do, I think, but you tell me. Well, it, it must be that. I, as I go back there and I'm like this child who's playing with something on the floor, I still don't feel like I was wrong. But it's uh, just... Well, I keep saying it. It's just so puzzling. Things don't make sense. And yet I see my mother change right in front of me. And I, I it doesn't make sense to me. All right. Well, let's go with that. Let's go with that. So there you are with, with Unseen Therapist. And you're looking at these in this cloud, in these dark spots. And there's this puzzlement. I don't really think I did anything wrong. Maybe I did, and you know, I feel like I did something wrong, perhaps, but that's the six year old, an unseen therapist. Hey, you're six years old. <laughs> Lighten up, says unseen therapist with her nice little humor. Okay. Your mother's having an issue, and you're puzzled, and you're sad about that. But you know, People have their issues throughout their life, including you. As you're going to be growing up, you're going to have a number of things. And sad, sadnesses and puzzlements go with it. Go with it. Okay. And so a loving thing to do, says Unseen Therapist, is for you to let your mother have her sadness. Just let her have it. She probably wants it. It's a way of, you know, helping herself through whatever tiredness and other issues with six children. It was six, right? Mm -hmm. and that, that she's doing. Let her have that, just like you can let your husband have his methodical ways. <laughs> let him do it. <laughs> He's going to do it anyway. <laughs> and your brother, he's got his reasons for doing what he's doing. And the loving thing to do is to leave it be. Let him have it. You don't need to get all worked up about it. It's age six or age 66 or whatever. You don't need to do that. And so let those things echo around in your head. Take a little time, whatever time you want. We're going to conclude with this, Barbara. Walk around in this cloud with unseen therapists within you. Go to the dark spots of your mother, the dark spots of you, the puzzlement, the sadnesses, all the stuff that's making the cloud not be white. And as best you can in your imagination, turn it to white. If you can, great. If you can't, well, just notice what you can't do. And whenever you're have gone as far as you think you can go. Just open your eyes and we'll talk. The the cloud with my mother it became white fairly easily. 
The one with my brother seems more complicated. He has an IQ of 70. And uh, so he's handicapped both mentally and physically. And he was a practicing alcoholic for 40 years until we could finally get him to live with us and got him sober. He's been sober now for four years. But he needs a lot of guidance. So it's a little bit different to, you know, let him have it. But I understand, I'm understanding more to let him have his resistance. Of course he has it. Of course he has it. So if I can accept him in the moment fully and yet lovingly encourage him to do what needs to be done, that feels right. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I'm still a little puzzled about my, um, is it control? But it doesn't feel like it. That feels like the right direction. The allowing him, like you say, the, I can see now the cloud becoming more and more white with him too. My hooks coming out of it. The heavy responsibility just doesn't feel heavy. Feels very loving and encouraging rather than berating and uh, it feels very clean right now well that's how it feels now good um as you may know if following my courses and all that i'm a great one for testing so I never want to be fooled by a temporary result. But let's, re let's go back for a moment. We're looking to get a good start. This doesn't mean we clean the whole thing out with one session. There's other pieces that go on and so on. But it's a good start. And so what you'll want to do is go through. We've recorded this for you. Okay. So you, you want to go through this session again tomorrow. All right. Um, you know, let the day go by in the evening and all of that, and just a little time go by and do it tomorrow. And um, see what happens. Now, I want to do a little testing other than that for the moment. Okay. At one point, before we started, the, your mother's hands on her hips. Okay. Oh, Barbara. Okay. <laughs> um, close your eyes now. We're going to test that. There she is again, the same mother, same old Barbara, whatever. It was a seven with seven with a really heavy, sad energy drain and the solar plexus thing, et cetera. What is it now? I mean, it actually feels there's a joy there. I don't know. I mean, that's interesting. The energy has certainly come up. There's a, I mean, maybe there's a one, but I, it's like a zero, really. I don't feel any of those okay. negative heaviness of before. Well, that's, that's encouraging. And the likelihood, in my experience, is that, is that we're pretty much done with it. But that doesn't mean we are done with it. So tomorrow morning, you'll want to run that image again. Um, and... In fact, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it now a different way. This is another kind of a test. All right. So go back and close the eyes. There you are with your mother, hands on her hips. Oh, Barbara, you know, and that kind of thing. And we want to we want to exaggerate things, exaggerate the sights, the sounds, the gestures, the feelings. Literally, try to get yourself upset. Be, be that little girl looking through your eyes and there's your mother and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. try to do it and tell me what happens. Uh, I actually, 
I mean, this is kind of bizarre, but I see the two of us laughing. All right, good. There's sort right. of a, it's right. a, she, she does this thing. Yeah, sort of like it, it, it dissipates into this kind of like shaking head chuckle. Okay. Well, good. Very solid signs. You'll want to run that movie again tomorrow morning. All right. Literally trying to get yourself upset. And if something shows up, now this is this is lesson number three in your advanced lessons in your course. Okay. If something shows up, it's most likely not what we were working on. It will be some other aspect, some related issue some related emotions you hadn't thought about, we didn't put it on the table to begin with. It would be something else in there. That's a pointer. That's unseen therapist telling you, oh, oh, we didn't do this one. You didn't put it on the table, undone kind of thing. But chances are we have, we have taken that one contributor to the impatience problem with a good start, if you will, and yeah. done something with it. Now, with the recording, you can go back to other things that may occur to you, other specific events and so on. And run the, if you want, run the very same recording of you and I doing this session, but plug the other thing in. It takes a little skill to do that, but you can plug other details into there uh, yeah. if you want and do that. Um, another little test. Uh, I, I have a sentence for you to say, so say the sentence and then tell me how true it feels on a zero to 10 basis, okay? I must do it right. I must do it right. Uh, that's still four or five. Well, it, it was a nine, all right? Oh, yeah. But now that's, that's, a, um, that's a really good clue. See, I, I, I wouldn't expect in one session to cover this broad thing, okay? We got a good start. But this clue, I must do it right. There's something more in there. I must do it right. Where did that come from? You'll have to, you know, you can launch from this into those, those other pointers. Okay, thank you. It All feels right. very clean. All right. Well, okay. good, good. Here's my kiss, okay? Thank All you. Right. See bye you bye. later. All right, bye.